everyone, welcome. I'm Roy, Roy Ripper, and I'm the host of the Recruitment Marketing Machine Online Summit. It's the summit um, for creating a marketing machine in your recruitment business so that you can generate more candidates and more clients uh, on autopilot. Um, and I'm really excited. My guest today is Johnny Campbell of Social Talent. Um, let me tell you about Johnny. I've known Johnny for, for many years. Um, probably more years than he or I would uh, would care to admit. We've shared the stage, I think. We've trained clients together. Um, certainly, Johnny is somebody that I've recommended into uh, a number of my clients, and he's actually one of the nicest guys out there as well. Um, Johnny, just a little bit of history, worked as a recruiter in two of the most extreme locations, were extremely diverse. Johnny won't mind me saying this. He started off as a recruiter in Ireland, I also know that he worked as a recruiter in the Caribbean. It's like, it, you know, two completely different uh, realms as far as weather goes anyway. Um, but he's been doing, sorry, he was recruiting since 1998, I think it was. Johnny runs Social Talent now, um, one of the world's leading providers of online recruitment training. And Johnny leads the company's product strategy, uh, marketing and content teams at Social Talent. Um now, look, I will say to you, Johnny's probably actually one of the you know most popular speakers. Uh, Johnny travels all over the place. I'm sure he's going to tell us about uh, some of the places that he's, he's been to very recently and he's about to go to. But Johnny is known in a lot of recruitment training circles for his sourcing. Uh, you know, he's known as a sourcing ninja um, and, and uh, you know, prolific in, in, in that particular area. But today, Johnny's going to talk about candidate attraction as opposed to candidate sourcing. Uh, Johnny, how are you? I'm all right, Roy. I'm back in Dublin, which is nice for a change. <laughs> it is a, in stark contrast to the Cayman Islands, I'll give you that. Um, but it's nice to be home once in a while. It's I also bet. nice to get away to the sun once in a while too, Roy. And Johnny, you know what? Dublin's one of my favourite, mm. favourite cities in the whole world. It's like it's got an energy... And it, it hums along at a kind of a, a vibrancy that no other place, I think, on earth matches. So yeah. I think you're pretty fortunate there. Cayman's pretty good too, but um, I, I do like Dublin. Yeah, I, I, I take Cayman most days. <laughs> Dublin's lovely to visit. Uh, Cayman's better to live. Yeah, I'll tell I, you that I, for sure. yeah, hands down. I'd agree with that one. Johnny, look, I'm really keen to get into this. And and look, first of all, what's what's what do we say would qualify you to talk about candidate attraction you're the guy that's known as you know the sourcing ninja and 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 i know your work in that area you know it's like i learn from you um and i definitely have, have, have kind of quoted you as one of my mentors in, in in that region but the whole candidate attraction piece why why are you you know good to talk to us about that particular area so thank uh, boy thank you first of all the wonderful introduction as well so what i do is uh, i can, don't consider myself a sourcing specialist, right? I consider myself somebody who is intuitive and good about how do you basically, how do you find the right people for jobs? How do you basically deliver business results by getting the right talent in place? Sure. I just happen to have come from it before I set up social talent from the perspective of, you know, having to source candidates to do that. This was back in the recession, 08, 09. We were running an agency. And the only way you could really survive was to go for talent nobody else was finding. And sure. we built our whole sourcing techniques out of that. But sourcing is not the be all and end all. And in fact, when I look at, so as a business owner now, who you know, we have a dedicated recruiter, we're, we're expanding at a rapid pace. We hired 18 people last quarter alone. Um, I look at how we now recruit, knowing what we know, having the repertoire of knowledge. We filled all 18 of those roles through job advertising, through traditional either referrals where we're marketing them to our staff or referrals in the market. We didn't source one single one of those roles. Wow. And, and it pulls me back to when we originally developed our, our curriculum for the black belt. You know, sourcing is what a lot of people would have bought the curriculum for, how to source better, this new technique that they didn't have experience in. Yeah. One of, the, one of the, the hidden surprises in our content is our piece on job advertising. And we purposely put it in before the sourcing piece right. because I feel it's remiss of us to teach someone how to source if they're not already effectively advertising. And the reason for this is most jobs in the world are filled by running an ad yeah. somewhere. 
whether it's on a bulletin board, on your career site, on an online job site. That's how most people find jobs. It's sure. not through sourcing. Sourcing should be what you do when advertising isn't working or you know in advance it's unlikely to work. So it's right. complementary. Um, and it's, it's the feedback we constantly get is, you know what, love the sourcing, great. Really surprised at the job advertising content because all of us are doing it for so long. We've almost written it off. It doesn't work. It's broken. Um, you know, there's no point in doing it. Yeah. We look for something new. I just don't believe that. Do you know, Johnny, on the on the advertising thing though, you know, I, I speak to a lot of people and, and uh, recruitment business leaders like you do, and and some of them I hear through, back from saying things like, you know, job boards are, are dead at the end of the job board, mm -hmm. and advertising isn't giving them the the you know the, the candidates, and that's why traditionally they flock towards you know sourcing techniques and and all the things that I know you previously have taught. What would you say to those guys that say, you know, the job boards are dead? So, Roy, I, I'll put you in a scenario, right? You own a store on a high street. Yeah. And you're, selling, you're selling computers, right? Okay. Um, now, you've got all your sales staff lined up. You've got six people who can take, um, uh, take orders at the cash registers. You've got floor staff available. And you go and put posters all over the town. You're opening for business, right? Sure. On your first day, you open the doors. There's a queue, right? There's a queue outside. And the people flock in. Yeah. And your store is rammed all day long. You're I'm like, happy. I'm happy so far. This is awesome. <laughs> so at the end of the day, you're, you're, you know, you're going, you close the doors and you go to your sales team and go, how do we do, guys? And they go, not so good. <laughs> so you look at the, 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 the cash receipts and it turns out that at best, you're making one sale out of every 500 person, Ridiculous. people that come through your door. Right. So stand back a second. Do you blame the posters you put all over the town or do you blame whatever happened in your store that day? Yeah, whatever happened in the store. It's got to be, right? So, so this, is, this is what's happening with job advertising on our websites or on the job boards, right? When you look at the detail, and a few people look at the right detail. When you look at most career sites, I'll give you an example of a customer of ours uh, in Europe, they were, they, they, when we used to do consulting years ago, Roy, when you do anything for money, right? Um, <laughs> and that's what I had to do. Um, what do you want me to do? I'll do it. Um, so I had a client of ours who said, can we come and get them more traffic on social media? Well, this is the early days of social recruiting, like just get more people on Facebook and Twitter. Okay. I was like, why? Well, we're looking to fill these really difficult jobs for these engineers all over Europe and uh, we just don't have enough people. So we get them through social and we'll figure it out. Right. I said, well, I said before I do that, so I'll take your money for whatever you want, but can I see your Google Analytics? Do you mind having a look at your career site? Because I just, right. you know, they're a big brand. I suspected they had good, good traffic. It turns out that on average, they had between one and 2,000 views per job ad on their site. Okay. But no, no one was, was getting hired, and their apply rate was like 3 or 4%. Wow. And so I put the question back to the head of recruitment. I said, what you're asking me to do, similar to your situation, is bring more people into your front door. Yeah. Your front door is fine. Your, your shop is packed. Yeah. Loads of people. You're just not converting them. And, and, and this way of thinking about our job ads, most of us look, if you're paying for a job post, you're probably getting several hundred, maybe even thousands of job views. Yeah. And then you say, well, nobody got hired. The quality's poor. Right. Well, to me, that's up to you, right? You know, your advertising partner, which is your career site or it's your, 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 your job board, they can only do so much. They can advise you on how to get people into your store, which is viewing your job ad. Sure. But really, it's to you to one, have a marketable product, to market it in the right way, and understand customer psychology in terms of, you know, for example, it could be on the technology side, you know, having enough cash registers and accepting credit cards. So this is the equivalent of your, your, your apply experience. Right. Do you ask them 20 questions? Um, do you only accept an upload of a Word doc, which is the same as going, sorry, cash only, or we only accept Amex. Right. Well, can I get your cash? Nope. Amex only. And the customer's going, that's silly. Yes. And the same reason going, I'd love to talk to you about that job. And you go, can, do you have a CV? Well, well, no, but can I talk to you? Well, not really, no. <laughs> the only way you can apply is to upload this document you pre-formatted. Uh, pre so, so there's some of the issues, that, you know, just technology. But They'll end up going somewhere else, right? They will. They go, yeah. and I, you know, Amazon discovered this years ago with one-click purchasing. You even have to sign in, refill out the order form, will lose people. So you kind of have to make it really, really simple yeah. to 
to transact. That's the apply thing, right? But you pull it back even down to just before you get there, because most of us, you know, we can't change our websites. We're not in a position to go revamp the career site. And you know what? If I advertise on Indeed or Monster, I have to go with their formats. Right. How do you make that work? There's, there's some basic things we do wrong that when you change them, you can transform your job advertising. You won't fill every role, Roy, but I would challenge any recruiter, whether you're working for a third party or in-house, no matter whether you're working skilled or unskilled jobs, you can transform your metrics from whatever you're doing right now right. without spending a penny, Roy. So, so the kind of most basic on this is, um, and there's, there's lots you can do, but let me, let, let me start with this idea. So if I'm reading a, a piece of text to you, Roy, and I'm saying, we're an um, Irish company uh, based in Dublin. We employ 50 people. We're in recruitment mar- uh, training, online platform. Uh, we have lots of different things here. We're, we're expanding out to different markets. We're blah, blah, blah. Right? That's one way I could phrase it. Sure. But now I'm going to say this to you. I'm going to say, Roy, this is an opportunity for you to join a business that's expanding all over Europe. In your role, you'll be helping us transform the way people think about recruiting and deal with talent acquisition. Yeah. Your first task is going to be blah, blah, blah. Then you'll do this and you'll have the opportunity to do this. The, the changing in just basic language, which is moving away from I, we, our, us. Yeah. You, 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 your, yours. Yeah. It's one of the smallest, simplest things you can do in recruitment marketing. But there's a psychology behind this. Um, and it doesn't just apply for your job ads, right? This could be your whole marketing strategy for employer branding, but take it slow, take it simple. Yeah. When you force yourself to ban the words, I, we, are us, and instead only use phrases like you, your, and yours, yeah. you have to write in a different style. And what you're doing, Roy, if you can think about it, is you're putting the person into the, you're, you're drawing them in to this role and they're being forced to think of themselves in this job. Yeah. Rather than sitting way back passively not thinking about it, you're right up in there with the job, you're <laughs> in it, you're experiencing it, all this kind of good stuff. And, and you'll see this, in, you'll start noticing this in all of your consumer advertising out there. Absolutely. You see that advertising that is about you, 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 yeah. down to the words they use, yeah. it's just more compelling than the I, we, our, us. That yeah. makes sense? Uh, do you know what, Johnny? This is really interesting. And and just when you were saying that about the uh, the you, I was thinking about the Uncle Sam recruiting poster of old. You know, I don't know how many hundreds of years that go that was, but Uncle Sam pointing and and it, this was a graphic poster. Your country needs you. Um, you know, in the UK, Kitchener as well, exactly the same poster. Your country needs you. Um, but, but even even similar, Roy. Right? It's been a long time since probably either of us have dated. Right? In dating <laughs> circles, you're on a you're on the dating circle. And God, it's been a long time since I was in that. Right? Pre Tinder age. But you don't sit there and you have your first date and you don't go, "Well, Roy, let me tell you about myself. I'm yeah. doing this, that, yeah. the other." Yeah. So you know, the person says, "So Johnny, tell me about yourself." You go, "No, Roy, tell me about you. Yeah. What are you interested in doing? What do you do?" <laughs> but again, the person goes, "Well, actually, you know." It's just changing the language in a conversation one-on-one. This should be best practice if you're doing pitches to clients, if you're in an agency, you're meeting new candidates. You always focus on the you. Yeah. Make someone else feel special. Don't let it be about you. And, and I, I was at a session on, on just a, nothing to do recruiting, but on communication. And I think you, you, you'll have heard of this. I maybe even stole this off you. Maybe it was your <laughs> session. But the idea of you have two, two ears, one mouth. Use them in that ratio. It's a good and, one. It's an old one, but it's a good but one. It, it should be the writing style as well. Yeah. It should be that, you, you know, when your ears are open when you're using you language. Yeah. Your mouth is open when you're using I, we, us, our language. So it's just doing that right. Do you, do you know what, Johnny? It reminds me as well because um, it, 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 you're absolutely right. The you, writing about you concept um, is copywriting 101. However, I know that, you know, working in recruitment for as long as, as both of us have, I remember some of the early adverts, job adverts that, that we used to write. And, and I know the recruitment company still doing this type of advert. Well, they'll kick off the opening paragraph is our client. And then the rest of the ad, advert kind of proceeds. These are print adverts, by the way, but the rest of the advert would go into why the client's the number one in the industry, why the client does this, what the client is and how big they are and how well known they are. And then there's this final tiny little sentence right at the very bottom, which is, you know, something along the lines of, uh, and you would, you know, unrivaled prospects and a fantastic career, phone this number. Now, 
I, I learned this really early on, this, you know, the concept that you're talking about, but so many of my competitors really didn't, which was when you look at that print advert, 99% of it was talking about us, like, mm -hmm. you know, not the you, but us and our client and, and the, the 0.1% or whatever it was that was left was some throwaway, you know, phrase for the candidate. And one of the first things that I, I tried to do, I didn't always do it successfully, but was just reverse that, you know, it just made perfect sense to me. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. I think that, you know, smart recruiters, smart businesses uh, understand this. You mentioned about, you know, sort of uh, consumer advertising that's out there. Think about some of the strongest, you know, ads really get to our hearts. You know, they talk to us, the consumer, as opposed to, uh, you know, telling us all about their wonderful product and company to the point where some of those adverts, you don't even know what the product or the company is, do you? you well, there's uh, another thing, another thing in terms of like one, one on that first, rather just be a theory, that first, that first tip there. Uh -huh. um, there was a, you, there was an academic study published in 2014 with three universities, one, two in Canada, one in the US right. that took this uh, the, the hypothesis in the US bank for six months and they ran two versions of every ad. Uh, one was what they called the company-centric version, which is the, here's everything you need to do to be able to work here, right. Right? which is what we all do. And the second, which was the hypothesis, was there's a different way of writing job ads. It basically said, here's what we'll need you to do, which is kind of simple, but they always said, but well, here's how we'll help you get there. So which was the focus on, like, we'll help you do it through training, through resourcing, through team. It was still very formal language. Sure. Don't get me wrong, if you look at the exact examples used in this study, um, University of the Journal of Science and something. I'll dig out the link and we'll share it. Sure. Um, but it showed that two things, right? One, you triple the amount of people who apply for the jobs. Right? That's a no-brainer. Now, some of you might go, deadly. The others will go, ooh, I don't want more. More bad people is <laughs> not good. But the second thing they measured, which I thought was more important, was quality. Right. And, and the very simple measure of quality they used, Roy, was how many of those did we call forward for interview? What percentage? It's good KPI. So they tripled the volume. And they doubled the percentage of those that were called forward. So do the maths. That's a six-fold increase in quality of candidates. Brilliant. It's not just a theory. It drives six-fold increase in the amount of people you can get that are worth interviewing from your efforts. That's easy. That's a no-brainer. Easiest lesson you can learn in marketing. It's fantastic. It's a great takeaway as well. Um, Johnny, how does that work? You know, I know there'll be recruiters that are watching this now and saying, okay, you know, Johnny and Roy are talking about it's the opportunity in the client's company. It's the opportunity within each of these jobs that really gets that candidate eyes on first and then the, the quality and the traction. But how do I get that information from a client, that opportunity information? How do I get that from a client that, you know, barely understands how to spell that word or, you know, doesn't understand the whole concept behind opportunity sell? So I love this, right? Um, one, you can use five whys technique, okay. or what's known as having very small children who uh, <laughs> keep asking you loads of questions. Um, act like that. So, so when you start saying, for example, I need a new engineer. Right. Why? Well, you know, we need people to help develop and perfect this product. But why? Well, because, you know, quality is a really important part of our product because it's differentiated against our competitors and having that. Why? <laughs> well, in our industry, the things we're selling, they go into airplanes and, uh, you know, um, they have high quality. Why? Because well, airplanes fall out of the sky if they're not high quality. Ah. <laughs> so this engineer is going to stop people from dying in airplanes. <laughs> sure. But, but when, you, when you kind of use five whys for anything, and I've challenged, I challenge, my best example um, last year was somebody said, we hire undertakers. And I was like, how do I do this? <laughs> but, you know, five whys is actually, actually really easy for undertakers. It's all wrapped around, ignore opportunity for a second. What is the purpose? Yeah. This role. Purpose is really important. There's a great book by a guy called Aaron Daniels who writes about the purpose economy, right? And um, a third of it's fluffy nonsense, two thirds of it's good concrete stuff, right? Yeah. And, he, and he defines purpose as the three types of purpose we all look for. There's personal or individual purpose, there's a group um, or social purpose, and then there's societal purpose. Okay. So it, it hit me when I was, I was on a, a flight to uh, Orlando last week and I watched, you watched that movie The Intern with Robert De Niro? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, it's schmaltzy, but I really liked it, right? It's good. And it's about a retired gentleman whose wife has recently um, died, and he's looking for purpose. 
Right. Right. And this is the thing that we all aspire for. We want to, we want a sense of belonging. Everybody yeah. wants a sense of I am worth something to somebody. Yeah. So, so the three levels of purpose will be around like individual purpose. I am really good at something. I am the best at whatever, right? I am the best at playing guitar. I'm the best at this. I had a friend of mine, um, uh, a wife of, of, of one of my best friends. I used to work with her and him in recruitment. And on Friday night, we went down to the local church and she sung in a choir. She's never sung in public before, terrified at the idea. She did a solo of an amazing Mariah Carey song. Mariah Carey in a church, who'd have thought? But it was amazing. <laughs> and that was her personal purpose to prove to her Self, she could get up and do that, and she was glowing. This yeah. meant so much to her. Yeah. Or it could be, it could be the kind of social purpose, which is about I'm needed in my team at work. I'm needed. If I don't get in to work and do my part of the job, others can't do theirs, and it all falls down. Yeah. People need me. Yeah. Or it could be the the bigger purpose. It could be the we had a lady come in here this afternoon and pitch to our team about. Um, she, I, I donate platelets every month, uh, uh, Roy, platelet donations, blood donations, sure. it's a type of blood donation. And um, she came in to pitch to our staff to try and get more of them to sign up. And that's about societal um, purposes, right? Helping, she told stories about kids with leukemia, people who had newborn babies, premature, needed all these uh, uh, tra uh, uh, transfusions and stuff. Yeah. That's about giving something back to society. But I believe that every single job that you hire for can be pitched to some level of purpose. Yeah. How are you selling individual, um, group, or societal purpose? So if you join us, this is what we do. So it could be we do as a business, we help society this way, or we help people this way, and here's how you fit into that cog, yeah. where you are in that chain, and why you're so important. It could be here's what you'll get out of this individually, and how you'll grow in this. Or it could be that you're part of a team, this is a super critical role, and without you, the rest of us who are brilliant, we all fall down because you're so important to that. I don't believe there's a job in the world that can't be written selling that. But when you sell purpose, which is this whole concept of emotional marketing, you're actually not selling functional responsibilities. You're, sens you're selling the sense of achievement or the journey to that sense of achievement that somebody's coming along with, that you're inviting them to join you on. That is just so much more powerful than an opportunity. Opportunity is bullshit. We overuse that. Sell purpose. What is the purpose of this role? Yeah. Use five whys when you're talking to the hiring manager to get that. Why do you work here? Without this person, what would happen? Without that process, what would happen? What would happen? What would happen? Back to the, this company did not exist. Yeah. What would happen? And all of a sudden you go, that's my story. That's what I'm selling. Johnny, that's a wow. That's a wow in a moment, you know, just all by itself. Um, and I don't think I've ever heard it kind of explained in that way. It's like, you know, I've heard Tony Robbins talk about purpose and, 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 and it being like, a you know, one of the key drivers for human nature but not applied to uh people's you know job roles and, and and absolutely right we spend more time kind of in in our work than perhaps any other role so um you know why not use purpose and, and use those drivers um i'm sure that we're gonna have people watching this saying uh you know trying to challenge your your statement about uh, that, that, that you believe there's not a job role out there that cannot be defined by its purpose. There'll be people that are emailing you and I right now uh, saying, yeah, but what about this one? Or what about that one? Oh, I can't wait. Bring I it can't on. Wait. Yeah. I love it. That's, that's the challenge. Well, you know what? I'm gonna, before they get into that argument, let me present a third tip for you that is going to really mess with people's heads, right? Cool. And it's going to, I've seen, I've seen software that tries to do the opposite of this, right? Okay. I'm going to tee it up and ask you a question again, All right. uh, Roy. So when you're online, in general, and you're reading stuff, it's not to be about recruiting, right? What are the kind of what, what are the sites or pages that you generally read on a daily or weekly basis? What kind of places do you go to just to consume content? Yeah, um, uh, specific sites or just blogs in nope, general, like news, uh, sports, anything. Okay, yeah. Listen, that, that's good. Um, I do go to sports. I, I probably look at BBC. <laughs> Uh, their, their, their football pages probably daily if I'm being really honest but don't tell the boss um, I do look at news sites again you know I'm a big fan of the BBC but also to try and look at, at different news sites as well um, you're BBC centric I'm getting yeah, this I, yeah probably right? That's <laughs> I hadn't even cool. thought of and I listen to radio too even I'm worse I'm stop you there right <laughs> BBC right next time you go on to the BBC to check the news to check I know you check the gossip the Hollywood <laughs> gossip right I know you do Roy right? and, and your sports right when you're looking up what the Kardashians are doing look at the article right and these are articles whether it's 
it's a it's a sports website, whether it's uh, dailymail.co.uk uh, or any of these sites, Gossip Mag, Sports, whatever it might be. Sure. Have a look at the, the format of the page. Yeah. What you're looking at is a page that is extremely successful at getting people to read content. Yeah. Content. Yeah. We need to stop thinking about what does a good job ad look like and think more about what does engaging content look like? Because yeah. you know what it never looks like, Roy? When you're reading about the news results, when you're reading about the sports, it's never a list of bullet points. No. Ever. No. And, and we have this thing in recruiting that we need to list bullet points. And the software that says you haven't had enough bullet points in your, I won't say uh, the word, your effing <laughs> job ad, right? It's not natural to read content. It's, what's more natural, short, snappy paragraphs yeah. with easy headings to guide you. Stories right? as well. Little stories, little yeah. sections. And you can look at a thing and go straight to the header of the paragraph that's yeah. most relevant if you don't have enough time to read the whole thing. Yeah. Or you can start at the start and you always have, I see five headers, I've broken the five sections, I get how this is going to flow. Yes. The best job ads. The best job ads don't have bullet points. They have nice digestible sections with good headers. It's such a simple thing. It's largely controversial. Who'd have thought people get so upset and so protective about bullet points? Because they do, Roy, because I've told them about this. <laughs> and we've done it. And I'll be honest. When and I, I used to. This, for three years ago, someone said this to me, and I was like, nah, nah. Come on, bullet points. I get the other stuff, language. Bullet points, it's easy. You easy get all the snappy read. stuff. It's not easy to read, Roy. It's easy to write. <sighs> Yeah. And that's why I think we become obsessed with it, right? Yeah. Because good text and content online never follows that format. Start writing your job ads more like the articles you read every day because that's what people are most used to. You're throwing this unnatural style of reading online to a user base. And it doesn't inform them very well. Yeah. You can have nice short paragraphs. and It's important with the right levels, sections bolded and so on and so forth. And it's easy to just read, follow where you want to follow. It, work, it makes for better content. So you, you know, you, just to wrap it into kind of the, the three tips so far, sure. you're kind of saying, first of all, you, you're your language. So candidate-centric language, not company-centric language. Right. You're focusing on purpose, not responsibilities. Good. And you're organizing it not in bullet points, but in short, snappy paragraphs with good headers. Like, that's the template. Those three things is a good a general guide as you can get to writing good job ads. There's tons of things you need to tweak and make better along the way. Don't get me wrong. But I think all of us could start with that. They're the three high impact ways where your most, your most prevalent piece of recruitment marketing, which is your job ad, the thing that your candidates are going to most often see, and in study after study, candidate experience awards, for example, in US and Europe, always say the top piece of content that's most valuable to a job seeker is the recruitment job ad. Right. It's the most rel thing that they'll always go to. And it's usually a piece of shit, right? <laughs> it's usually just not good. And we can make it so much better and it has the power to influence. And if you don't believe it has the power to influence, walk into your store the next, the next time you're going shopping, Roy, and you're shopping for shampoo, because I know you look after your hair, it looks beautiful, <laughs> right? Is ask yourself why you buy in different brands. Is it because of the bullet point list of ingredients on the back? No. Or is it to do with some sense of brand loyalty you get from the images, the colors, the things they've chosen, right? We can't all, if we could, it'd be wonderful put fantastic logos and images on all our job ads, because that can work too. Sure. It's a whole separate conversation. But what we can do is we can build emotional stories around the way we're describing candidate-centric, purpose-driven job ads in a nice structure that feels more like I'm reading a BuzzFeed article and less like it's a hard job ad I'm having to read. Yeah. That makes sense? Uh, Johnny, listen, it makes perfect sense. And you know what what I love about what you've just said is you've made it really simple. You've given us three things that we can specifically do um, that addresses it rather than say, hey, you know what, this is like a massive science and I wouldn't know where to start. There's three very, very actionable points from, from, from what you've just discussed. Um, Johnny, I'm tempted to ask if I was a recruiter at my desk right now, is there anything apart from those three things that you know I could I could do or that recruiter could do that would get them instant results? Is there any like final takeaways apart from those three? Yeah, let, let, let me fire a couple at you, right? So, um, so one is when you're sharing your job ads on social because we all love to do this. I see it on my stream on LinkedIn. I'm sure you do as well. <laughs> Um, social requires a different type of content. Right. Um, a link to a big job out of text, which even what I've described is still a big job out of text. 
isn't going to get someone's attention in all that noise. Sure. When you look at your social feed, your Facebook feed, your Twitter feed, Roy, what jumps out at you? What type of content appears and catches your eye the most in a big list? Uh, pictures for me, uh, yeah. You can stop you there. Pictures, right? Yeah. I've seen some great examples. The recruiting team at Intel, recruiting graduates have produced these lovely, timely, simple images that they're building like in their PowerPoint decks and screenshotting. And it's just an image and then has a link to where they can go find the job ads. Yeah. But you're engaging people with a funny picture, somebody's face, non-corporate looking stuff. Um, I just do a fantastic presentation by Slinda Appleby, pardon me, in Oracle um, yeah. in Sherm last week uh, in, in Orlando. And she talked about how they tried the corporate type imagery around stock photographs of cool people right. um, with the job ads, didn't work. And then they just take people having fun, real people, you know, emotional scenes, and this quadruple their traffic to their job ads. So when you're sharing photos, link with the photo for sure, maybe even a mention of a website on the photo, but images, I just don't bother sharing it. That, that's, that's my number one. Johnny, can I, I just stop you there? I, I totally agree with that. I think, um, you know, I read somewhere, and in fact, I know, because I, you know, this is my experience as a user as well. Um, quote cards, you know, not just the words written, but where it's a graphic, um, and a really simple tool. I'm sure you, you know, you guys have come across this before. I know you embrace, you know, any good technology or any good software. But there's a tool called Canva.com, yeah. um, free tool that you know you don't have to be a graphic designer. But instead of just, if you can use, you know, photographs or, or images that you own, brilliant. But at the very least, you can use Canva to make your I know your words kind of stand out, but it's in a style that you create. So, you know, instantly there's color in it, there's, you know, graphics in it. Um, and it, it sometimes can just make really simple tweets or posts come alive. So, yeah, I'm all yeah, over image. I'm, I'm, I'm was awesome. Yeah. And the thing is, you don't have to get it right first time. Make 10, make 10 of them, see exactly. which one works. Exactly. They, they should be throwaway. It shouldn't be your whole week's work putting into getting the perfect image on Canva right. Try a few things. Sure. They can be wrong. I've seen big organizations like Microsoft who kind of went through this program with us and then sharing out like Christmas wish lists. And you know, they're really humorous, they're fun, they're on LinkedIn, and then they have a link to the job ads in the bottom. Beautiful stuff, right? Perfect. But try 10 of them. And the one that works, share with your team and go, right, that's the one that worked, lads. Let's, let's use that again. Great tip. Se second and last tip I'll leave you with, Roy, is around being found. So you can have the best job ads in the world. So what we're talking about is all the things in store we need to fix. Yeah. But we forgot the thing about how do you get them in the store in the first place? What if you don't have that traffic coming into your store? What if you're the store that has no people? So you don't have a problem to get over over not converting. SEO. SEO confuses the hell out of people. How do you get top of the rankings on Indeed, on Monster, on Google, on all these different places, right? And it's really simple to get it right. And it's this. If you as closely match what the job seeker types in, yeah. you come up closer to the top of the results. Right. And the simplest way to think about that is, what is the job title I'm using? Because the job title will drive most of the keywords that a candidate chooses to put in her search. Yeah. So when a candidate's typing her search in and she's saying, senior marketing jobs, head of marketing jobs. If your job is head of marketing, right. you're in business. If it's CMO, I just don't think, but do the research, that as many people search for CMO as they do for head of marketing. Yeah. It might be a fancy title that you guys love using in your business or your client loves using in their business, but it's not what people are looking for. Yeah. You need to, it's not dumbing it down, you just need to make it more universal. Um, and you can, there's a great way of doing this if you look at Google Trends and you type in keyword searches for a bunch of different phrases for, let's say, job site names and type them into Google Trends. It will plot them against each other and you can pick by country, even part of the country. You could say, in the UK, do people use CMO, head of marketing, marketing manager, manager of marketing, whatever it is, and you plot them against each other and you see the, the winner is just, it shines. Yeah. And I put the word jobs on the, at the end of it. And you all of a sudden, okay, that's the phrase we should use. Stop relying on what was written in the job spec. Start focusing on language that best matches what seekers look for and you'll win. Johnny, wow, man, that's a, that, that's just a great knowledge bomb just by itself. And, and the, the whole of our conversation today has been packed with stuff like that. Um, I, Johnny, listen, I'm, I, you and I could speak for hours. I know that. And, and, and maybe there's some room here for uh, some other 
uh, webinars that we do in the future. I know there's going to be a whole heap of questions that come up from this. Um, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you, Johnny, after this show? So find me online, Google Johnny Campbell Social Talent, you'll find me somewhere. I'm on Facebook, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Twitter, I'm on the web. If you're a good searcher, good recruiter, you'll find me. Um, I'm, op- I'm actually best on, on Twitter. I just got a new handle. I had to move off the social talent handle. I'm now at Johnny Campbell, J-O-H-N-N-Y Campbell. Um, DM me, tweet me, and um, I'm happy to have a chat. Fantastic. Johnny, we'll publish all of those links and everything else that you know, you've suggested today uh, in the show notes below this. Um, Johnny, look, on behalf of everybody uh, here at Recruitment Marketing Machine Summit, thank you so much for sharing so pleasure. much with us today. Pleasure. Tip of the iceberg and a real pleasure. Anytime, Roy. Thanks, Ble- guys. Bless you. Bye-bye.